it has to be said that islands are absolutely central to everything about Mervyn Peake's life and career. This is also where my father, Mervyn Peake, would have arrived in the summer of 1932 to have a, a small recce at uh, Sark before making up his mind as to whether to live permanently on Sark, which he did in the summer of 1933. And it's hard to separate them out and say, you know, which inspired which. Was he drawn to write and make pictures of islands because he visited islands? Or was the island something that was somehow or other part of his whole temperament? Gormenghast is a world in itself. There isn't really anything outside Gormenghast. Even in Tide to Salon, you don't feel that any of that stuff outside Gormenghast is really there. But it's a lovely, lovely day today. It's warm, it's sunny, the sea looks calm. It just looks absolutely lovely. He is depicting a world, and he expects you to be there and to live there and to experience it. You're not just dipping into a story. You have to inhabit Gormenghast, and, and in many ways, I think that's the charm of the books, and the people who get it really do get it, and they will be there in some part of their mind forever. A very significant impact that uh, Sark had on my father was that, that essentially Sark was his home. The boat approaches the island. A feeling of isolation from the world. Somehow I'm overwhelmed by a sense that my arrival is expected. The jetty dotted with figures. My eyes focus on a man. Tall, dark, compelling. The realization. I'm no longer alone. Author, poet and artist best known for the surreal novels set in a castle named Gormenghast, Mervyn Peake was also a wonderful father. As his son, I've spent much of my life trying to answer questions about him, about where his imagination came from, where was Gormenghast based, and even about the sad, horrific years he spent in decline, being moved from one institution to another. People ask me, who was he? He was so multifaceted that people found it difficult to say what he was because they felt that you couldn't be a writer and a painter and a poet and a playwright and all these other things at the same time. Joanne Harris, author and Peak fan. I think if you learn about his life, it enhances his writing if you look at it in terms of the experiences that Peake has gathered because he had a very interesting life, of course, and I think he's collected experiences and characters and obviously they inhabit his work. Sometimes I begin the story with his birth in 1911 in Kuling, China. His father, a missionary doctor, his house, which he said could have been transplanted from Croydon. Outside the gates was the wonderful and bewildering world of the Chinese Empire, a world he left at the age of 12 but never forgot. Nor the Mandarin he teased us with as children. I can still count from one to a hundred. E, er, san, so, u, liu, chi, I think the fact that Mervyn Peake grew up in both an enclosed society, a world that was really cut off from the Western world at the time, did have an effect on how he grew up. Brian Sibley, dramatist and Peake expert. He wrote about growing up in this missionary compound in China years later in the Radio Times, and he said, in the compound... God was at large, and the great missionaries loomed like mammoths. So I think we already have a picture of a child that's growing up in a community which is strange and alien. This is a world that is locked off. And I think that's the striking thing that we see in all of Mervyn Peake's writing, and it spills over into his drawings too, a world that are isolated, they're set apart. Here we are, we've arrived on Sark and uh, the boat is rocking a little bit but the heather comes right down to the sea. We look out and see Cat Rock. We're just about to get off the boat. A royal fief 
with its own set of laws and parliament, its own traditions going back hundreds of years, where bikes and horses rule the roads. The island of Sark. It's completely quiet, and that's what I remember from my years here, was the absolute quietness. Hello. Hello. Past the house which belongs to Reginald Giel, who's the um, Seneschal of Sark, or the chief law officer. But walking along these dusty tracks, it really seems rather exactly the same as it did uh, when I lived here. My father, Mervyn Peake, had returned from China to complete his education in Britain. He was tall, handsome, athletic. Having spent a year at art school in Croydon, then at the Royal Academy in London, he threw it all in. The invitation to live on Sark came from a man called Eric Drake who had taught him drawing at Elton College. And the arrival on Sark must have been for Peake an amazing experience because it's an island which is bound up, rather like Gormagast, in its own ritual and order that's quite apart and separate from anything else in the Channel Islands and in the rest of the United Kingdom. The house that he first went into was run by um, an elderly lady called Renouf, who had an African grey parrot that would shriek out in a Sarkis dialect. But after a while, he couldn't stay there any longer, so he went to a little sort of wooden cabin in the avenue, just sort of 50 yards away. And he was struck immediately by the landscape, particularly the seascape. He loved the precipitous cliffs. He loved the fact that there were these knuckles of rock sticking up from the water that uh, suggested whole worlds that were outside there. When uh, my father first came here in the 1930s, he went more or less straight into the depiction of the local terrain, the local cliffs. But as time went by, he moved on to the local people, the fishermen. Rosie Giel, how are you? I'm very well. Nice Nice to see you after all this time. Rosie Giel is from an old Sarkis family. An artist herself, she called me to tell me about two pictures by my father she thought I might be unaware of. Was she right? And now... I'm walking into a room full of paintings and photographs and and we walk... Ah, and now I'm looking at a picture I've never seen before by my father of a strange-looking creature. It's a horse with a lion's tail, dated 1946, so it would have been done on Sark. Very strange, I've never seen it before. Rosie had also lined up another picture and its subject... Georgina had twice been painted by my father, once as a little girl and then again as a beautiful, dark-eyed young woman. And then he did this painting for me and I used to go and sit at the chalet. Yes. How old were you then? Nineteen. So you remember him from from all that time ago and um, you also remember him from the earlier period when you were a young girl. Yeah, but I was very young then. Yeah. And he did a painting of me under a tree in the Vallette Garden. Yes. Well, that's 1933. I was holding a teddy bear. Mummy told me this. I was so young, I don't remember. And the teddy bear was bigger than me. <laughs> but when you were 19, he, he did, did that, that picture. I do remember when they started the gallery and we used to all go there. There were different artists over here at the time. Yeah. And, and all these artists were part and parcel of Sark. But he was part of us in a funny sort of way because he was so friendly, I think quite a character I understand my grandmother who's now passed away but she remembers your father working out on location and in the pubs you know uh, sketching the fishermen and Mm. growing up here for me I sort of always come into contact with people talking either about him or Mm. or seeing his work so it must have been amazing in 1930 to to have lived here with all the characters and must have been wonderful and just know the one story of a chap called Hamel who was uh, being painted but my father didn't really want to show him until the finished result was there but when he was allowed to have a look at it the fisherman he was so incensed by the way my father had captured his red nose from absinthe drinking that he took a fence and uh, turned around hit my dad on the jaw and knocked him out and he was uh, he was out for the count for some time so i think he was a bit wary about painting the uh, red noses of lobster fishermen in the future you know <laughs> 
He was extremely bohemian at this period of time. He had long flowing hair. He had a pierced ear with an earring in it, rather like a pirate. He wore capes. He wore brightly colored clothes. And I think being in this community that was itself a very small, tightly knit community of artists within another tightly knit community, the community of the Sarkis, was a fascinating experience for him. Today there are new buildings and changes afoot on the island, but then again some things never change, such as the horse-drawn carriages and the people who drive them. At the moment I'm speaking to the grandson of a great hero of mine who is called Cyril Wackley, who used to go down to the harbour and pick up all the goods for the different hotels and different people. I'm speaking to his grandson, but w which is fascinating, really, because he actually can speak the patois, the Norman patois. Oui. Oui. OK. Quand j'ai le temps, je reviens. Oui. OK. <laughs> Allez, à bientôt. À bientôt. Here you have the, the individual postman, the individual carter, the individual fisherman, and... Uh, I think that that might have had a, quite a bearing on the way he looked at his uh, characters in his books. Well, I think he's a very visual writer. He writes like a draftsman. Joanne Harris has long been aware of the strongly visual aspect of his writing style. And he creates mental pictures. And you can tell the picture that he's got in front of him or, or in his mind when you read the page. You, you realise, and he, he paints these extremely detailed portraits of his characters and sometimes he's actually physically done them as well I think he does them as, as an aid to uh, to remembering what his characters look like Hello! A sketch of Steerpike a face as pale as clay if it were not for his eyes it could be a mask <sighs> No one <sighs> I must escape somehow Those eyes set close together are small, dark red, and of a startling concentration. But you have pages and pages of physical description. He writes like somebody working with a lead pencil, and so there's a lot of shadow, there's a lot of uh, a visual effect there. The Sark group of painters, I think, was a liberating experience for Peake. It set down for him a place to which he wanted to return. <laughs> 